At one point in time, people really thought that TNA could compete with WWE the same level WCW could in its prime. They had a very stacked roster featuring some massive names such as the likes of Sting and Kurt Angle, and TNA also helped to build some amazing stars who we now see in the WWE such as AJ Styles, EC3 and Bobby Roode. At one point CM Punk was even in TNA before he went off to become one of the biggest stars in WWE history. So where did it all go wrong? With a roster as stacked as theirs, they should have been bound for glory, pun intended. Welcome to the day TNA Wrestling died. Welcome to part one of potentially three of maybe a little three part series depending on how well this video goes down in my series where I look at TNA through a timeline and talk about where it all went wrong for them. Now there is no definitive day that TNA died, I mean after all they're still running operations as a company but the day I'm selecting for this video is a day that I believe served as a catalyst and led to a downward spiral for TNA, making TNA lose all its popularity and putting it kind of in the place that it's in now in terms of how many viewers it has. Let's begin. Total Nonstop Action was founded by Jeff and Jerry Jarrett in 2002. The promotion was initially known as NWA Total Nonstop Action as it was associated with the National Wrestling Alliance, aka the NWA, not to be confused with the rap group. They looked to fill the void left by the death of WCW and create a potential competitor for WWE. And while they never really got onto WWE's level, for a good time they put on some great shows got many stars over, and attracted a very loyal and large fan base, and that's the important word, loyal. Between 2002 and 2006, I would argue was their glory years, between this time TNA had the likes of AJ Styles, Sting, Kurt Angle, Christian, Christopher Daniels, Bobby Roode, The Dudleys, Samoa Joe and Austin Aries, all of which were big stars in TNA. And between 2006 and 2010, they were an established company and known largely across the wrestling fan base. Here's the thing though, I should mention that while TNA were popular and the second biggest wrestling company, they were not perfect. In fact, they were far from perfect. There were a lot of bad moments and angles, but the only thing is that these angles weren't bad enough to put the company on a downward spiral that will ultimately make it lose its popularity entirely, like the moment I'm going to be discussing in today's video, and that is largely down to TNA's fanbase being very loyal and putting up with a lot, because believe me, they put up with a lot. Upon TNA's launch in 2002, infamous wrestling creative writer Vince Russo was signed to the promotion, assigning the guy that played a part in killing WCW was a weird move from TNA, but it's actually going to be a theme of what I'm going to be talking about in this video. He stayed between 2002 and 2004 where he was an on-screen character and reports came out that behind the scenes there was a creative power struggle over the direction of TNA which led to him leaving following Victory Road 2004. However, Vince would return as a writer for the TNA creative team in 2006 to 2012 during which time many dumb things happened, including but not limited to the reverse battle royal and the electric steel cage match, remember those? During this time it became a regular for the fans to chant fire Russo whenever a bad booking decision or terrible angle was happening. Vince would become the head of creative in July 2009, which was ironically the same month that Kevin Nash beat AJ Styles at Victory Road to win a title. What a coincidence! It was also this same event that saw Charmel take on Survivor contestant Jenna Morasca in a match that was labelled by Brian Alvarez of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter as the worst women's wrestling match of all time. And it was also the match that birthed this famous sound clip that you hear in the Botchamania intro. Minus five stars! By this point, TNA was really starting to replicate WCW. They had the same head writer, awful match stipulations, and relying on stars of the past and putting them over newer talents. Fans were starting to get sick and the only way for it to change was for someone in a high position to come in and change TNA and what they got instead was people come in a high position and reinforce everything I just mentioned. On October 27, 2009, 
it was announced that Hulk Hogan had joined TNA on a full-time basis. Also joining him was Eric Bischoff. The signing was reported worldwide with Bleacher Report calling the news piece a very weird story. Eric Bischoff and Hogan were both made on-screen characters while also working backstage. Eric Bischoff would work as an executive producer and Hogan's role was revealed by Dixie Carter in an interview in the UK Sun where she said quote, he is involved with everything from looking at the talent to how we shoot the show. Yes, that's right. That is how much involvement he had. <laughs> he was working with the cameras. The signing of Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff was announced on October 27th at a press conference in Madison Square Garden. Dixie Carter stated, Our goal is to become the world's biggest professional wrestling company. Hulk defines professional wrestling and we look forward to partnering with him in a variety of ways as we continue to grow TNA globally. Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo, three key figures in killing WCW were now all working together again and trying to work out a way to become the biggest wrestling company in the world. Oh god, this is doomed from the start. Hulk Hogan made an appearance on the finale of the Ultimate Fighter Heavyweight on Spike TV, aka the same network TNA was airing on. Hogan would announce that Impact would be airing on January 4th for a special 3 hour episode. Now, this may seem insignificant, but the reason why I mention this and why this is significant and a big announcement is because January 4th was a Monday, aka the day that Monday Night Raw, the most popular wrestling show, airs. During this time, TNA aired their Impact TV show on Thursday and this one night only move to Monday nights would create a one night only ratings battle between TNA Impact and Monday Night Raw. The similarities can be seen from a mile away. Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff, two key figures in WCW, have come in and immediately announced a Monday show. Oh my god, this was the beginning of the end. And one thing that you might be wondering is how Vince Russo was going to work with Hogan and Bischoff as it's widely recorded that Vince Russo had major problems with Hogan and Bischoff during WCW, including an incident which saw Russo cut a shoot promo on Hogan and Hogan threatened to sue for defamation of character. However, despite these concerns, Vince Russo states that the three men on the January 4th episode met up and settled their differences. An interesting note is that it seemed as though WWE were actually treating the show as competition. They countered TNA's announcement of the show by announcing that Bret Hart would be appearing on Raw on January 4th for the first time since the Montreal Screwjob. Dixie Carter would then go on to state that while Spike was not expecting Impact to beat Raw in the ratings, it would be considered success if they managed to at least maintain their usual Thursday night Impact rating. Which, when you hear this quote, kind of makes you wonder why they put the show on that day in the first place. That's a complete lie. January 4th came round and TNA pulled out all the stops for this episode of Impact with three championship matches and many returns and debuts. The results of the show are as followed. Alex Shelley, Chris Saban, Consequences Creed, aka Xavier Woods, Homicide, Jay Lethal, Kiyoshi, Suicide and Amazing Red competed in a Steel Asylum match that ended in no contest for an interesting reason I'll mention in just a second. ODB defeated Tara aka Victoria to become the new Knockouts Champion, Awesome Kong and Hamada defeated Sarita and Taylor Wilde to become the new TNA Knockouts Tag Team Champions, Hernandez and Matt Morgan defeated Raven and Stevie Richards, D'Angelo De Niro defeated Abyss and AJ Styles defeated Kurt Angle to retain the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. The show also featured the returns of Scott Hall, Sean Waltman, Sting, Jeff Jarrett and Jeff Hardy who had only recently left the WWE and you might remember came out and just chilled on top of the cage during the Steel Asylum match which is why the match ended in a no contest by the way so imagine that. <laughs> we also saw the debuts of Ric Flair, Val Venus, the Nasty Boys and Orlando Jordan and with all these debuts and returns and just Sting, Ric Flair and Jeff Hardy alone, TNA might actually have been able to compete with WWE. However, the ratings came back and Monday Night Raw got an average of 5.6 and TNA got an average of 2.2. 2. 
Despite losing the battle to WWE, this set a rating for Impact, a ratings record for Impact, and gave confidence to Spike executives and TNA higher ups, which would cause something crazy to happen. On March 8, 2010, TNA Impact officially moved to Monday Night, competing directly with Monday Night Raw. In an interview with Bob the Love Sponge, Eric Bischoff said that he felt history was repeating itself in regards to him competing against McMahon for ratings once again. This move was doomed from the start and just was never going to work. They were more than doubled in the ratings on an episode that featured Jeff Hardy and Sting returning as well as Ric Flair debuting. If they're more than doubled in that, it was only downhill from there. On the 8th of March episode, Impact drew a 0.98 compared to Raw's 3.4. On March 15th, Impact drew a 0.84 compared to Raw's 3.71. March 22nd, Raw won 3.2 to 0.86. March 29th, Raw won 3.7 to 0.62. 5th of April, Raw won 3.15 to 0.9. April 12th, Raw won 3.24 to 0.8. April 19th, Raw won 3.05 to 0.95. April 26th, Raw won 3.3 to 0.5. May 3rd, Raw won 3.05 to 0.8. May 10th, nope, just kidding. The May 3rd episode was the final episode of Monday Night Impact. It ended after less than two months and just 10 episodes. It was a complete failure. They were doubled and tripled many many times during this ratings war and came nowhere near to beating Raw in the ratings. The big problems with these shows is that Bischoff and Hogan were on screen characters and were the main parts of each shows. Fans were longing for new younger stars to be built rather than just relying on former WWE guys and wrestling legends like they had just seen AJ Styles losing to Kevin Nash and the last thing needed was Bischoff and Hogan on screen as major characters. Hogan and Bischoff also used their high positions to put their untalented bland family members on TV. Garrett Bischoff, Eric Bischoff's son, was given lots of TV time and even joined TNA's awful attempt at a cool NWO style faction in Aces and Eights. And Brooke Hogan, Hulk Hogan's daughter got far too much TV time and honestly the less said about that the better. The day I believe that served as a catalyst for TNA's downward spiral in popularity is October 27th, 2009, the day Hogan and Bischoff were announced for TNA. If you want to compete with WWE, the last thing you want to be doing is hire two people in higher positions who are key to another company losing a war with WWE to the point of liquidation to work with another guy who is a key figure in another company losing a war with WWE to the point of liquidation of the company. It was always gonna fail, but the thing is, TNA president Dixie Carter was never gonna know that because she knew nothing about wrestling. Alright, for the first special feature of this video, we're gonna be playing TNA Impact Cross the Line. This game was released in 2010, and obviously since we were just talking about the Hogan era of TNA, I thought what better way to have our first special feature be than have it being a game that came out during the Hogan era. This game is basically uh, just TNA Impact, but for PSP. Uh, there was a Nintendo DS version released, but it's very complicated in terms of the controls, so I'm not playing it and I don't want to learn it. I've done the story mode and 100%ed it so I can unlock every character, which I will show you right now. I'll, unlock the, I'll show you the roster, Styles, Joe, Angle, a lot of your typical guys. I'm just going to scroll through it, you can take a look at it. But uh, Mike Tenay and Don West are in this. I'm not sure if they're actually in TNA Impact. Uh, we have all these guys, a lot of the fake ones from the story. Lethal, of course. Um, Ray, Tomko, uh, Eric Young and Sanjay Dutt. Uh, and then this game has... Yeah, we also have Consequences Creed, who I had no idea was in this. I'm not sure if he's in TNA Impact either. Then Mick Foley is someone who we have to unlock by winning a 25-man gauntlet, which I don't know if I'm prepared for that. Uh, but some notable people who are missing are Christian Cage, uh, Christopher Daniels, and Loki are all missing because they had left the company. But interestingly enough, Daniels is in the DS version as Curryman, and so is Hogan. But Hogan's not in this. 
which is kind of annoying. I want to play as Hogan. But we're going to do a match. Uh, the match types on this are different as well. You have all your standard ones from TNA Impact, but you also have Handicap and Full Metal Mayhem. So we're going to play Full Metal Mayhem because, oh yeah, also Gauntlet and Super X Cup. So yeah, uh, we're going to do Full Metal Mayhem though, and you'll see what Full Metal Mayhem is. I know what it is already. It's not what you think it is really. Um, I think we're going to play as... Who are we going to play as? Who have I not played as before? I'll play as Creed because I haven't played as him. And I will face the most difficult person on the roster, Don West. So we have this loading screen, very nice looking. Overall, this game is very polished, very nice looking for a PSP game. But let me show you what Full Metal Mayhem is. Alright? You just have random objects scattered all around. Like, those are air vents. You've got some signs. There's roadwork signs. I think there's going to be some chairs somewhere. Hopefully. Uh, no, there's no chairs anywhere, actually. But these operate, like, the exact same as a chair does. Like, I'm holding it the same way you'd hold a chair. Uh, but anyway, let's just beat the crap out of Don West with a roadwork sign. Poor guy. I don't know what difficulty this is on. It might be on the easy... I think this is on the easiest difficulty. He's, he's already got an orange body. Oh, wow. I've actually just destroyed him already. Uh, I'm going to get the air vent just to try it out. Air vents. Where is it? Yep, this works the exact same as a chair as well. Oh, there is a chair. Let me pick up that chair then. First, let me just destroy Don West. The self-destruction of Don West. Um, okay, and... Oh, I thought there was a chair here. There isn't. That's just a stop uh, roadwork sign. Never mind. Yo, Don West is hurt, bro. Alright, get in the ring now. Uh. Boom. What is Consequences Creed's finisher? I have no idea. It's actually really interesting to note that Creed was in this game before he was in like a WWE game. So this was his first video game, technically. Uh, still no chairs anywhere. Oh god. Oh my god, he just went for a big clothesline. Yeah, bitch. Big drop kick. He's got no offense in. I think this is definitely on the easiest difficulty. So, apologies, but... I'm just kind of showing you how the game works. This isn't really meant to be like a big gameplay thing. Uh, Don West, get your ass in the ring, boy, so I can finish you off. Before my finisher runs out, which it is about to, I think. <laughs> the way he runs just makes me laugh. Here we go. What's his finisher? Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Okay. Uh, let's just pin him here. Yeah, he's over. Oh, wait. He could kick out. Nah, he's not going to kick out. Yeah. Creed has just absolutely obliterated Don West. Anyway, um, yeah, I think that is pretty much it for TNA Impact Cross the Line. If you ever play TNA Impact, you know that they have um, steel chairs scattered around the ring in all matches. In this game, they don't. Only in Full Metal Mayhem can you actually get chairs. So that's pretty cool, I guess. But maybe in future videos, I'll try to run the gauntlet. Uh, I'll do a Super X Cup, maybe as like a Patreon series. Which people actually need to follow because I need money on Patreon because it's a hard time right now. But yeah, uh, check me out on Patreon if you want. You don't have to, obviously. Patreon.com slash Top Wrestling. And I'll do some more TNA Impact Cross the Line. But for now, let's get back to the video. Where we last left off, TNA had just failed to start their own Monday Night War with WWE. They attempted to compete with Raw on Mondays but only lasted three months and they lost every single time. Even though they never got near to competing with them, it was actually possible. And this is mainly in part because of the network that TNA Impact aired on, that being Spike TV. Spike TV was a popular and well-known TV network that airs the likes of Cops, my favorite show to watch on there, and for five years actually was the home of Monday Night Raw. When Raw would return to the USA Network in 2005, Spike TV would bring wrestling back to the network by acquiring TNA. With TNA Impact premiering on October 1st, 2005, the show originally debuted on Saturday, but would move to Thursdays in April of the following year, which is a day Impact is most closely associated with. And not Mondays, it's definitely not closely associated with Mondays. After Impact moved back to Thursdays following the failed Monday Night War, Business for TNA kind of just continued as normal, and despite their mistakes and awful pieces of television, TNA was still managed to pull in a decent and consistent viewership. It can't be overstated enough 
just how loyal TNA's fan base truly was, TNA was still pulling in numbers in the likes of 1 million to 1.4 million. For the next few years, more BS would take place in TNA, but once again, TNA's loyal fan base still stuck around. We saw the Jeff Hardy and Sting incident, Aces and Eights, Claire Lynch, etc., and it, it still didn't stop TNA's fan base from leaving. But something happened that made TNA lose a lot of their fan base. And the fact is, it wasn't something that made them not want to watch. It was something that would prevent them from watching TNA Impact. In 2014, it was reported by TMZ that Spike TV would not be renewing TNA's contract for Impact to air on Spike. And to many, including myself, this was a puzzling decision from Spike because, you know, despite TNA's awfulness and mistakes, they still drew viewers. And why would Spike want to drop a show that's drawing in 1 million to 1.4 million viewers for their network? I mean, it's clearly making them money and it's just, it's just confusing why they'd want to do that. However, reports came out from the Wrestling Observer newsletter that Spike executives dropped TNA Impact from the network because they didn't have faith in TNA's leadership to grow the company. And it's also said that the Vince Russo situation played a part in Spike dropping the show. And you're probably wondering, what's the Vince Russo situation? Well, sit back, I'm about to explain it to you. It's crazy. As I mentioned in the last video, Vince Russo was working with TNA as a creative team member, but he would actually leave the company in February 2012. However, again, in April 2014, PW Insider started reporting that Vince Russo had secretly been hired back by the company. Vince Russo denied the reports initially, but the reports would soon be confirmed as true. Dave Meltzer reported that the reason his hiring was kept in the dark and kept a secret is because Spike TV reportedly hated Vince Russo and TNA wanted Vince to work with them, but if Spike hates Vince Russo, they have to keep it a secret from Spike, and that's exactly what they did, which is absolutely mental. Vince Russo would release an official statement on his website claiming that TNA Executive Vice President John Gabryk told Vince that Spike was aware of his rehiring, but this clearly wasn't the case, and Vince is either lying or was lied to. On July 30th, 2014, Russo claimed that he was officially done with TNA, and shortly after, here's a crazy detail, he revealed he'd been working there since October 2013, which means he was working there for six months in secret before PW Insider reported it and found out, which is just so, so ludicrous. My god. So yeah, that was the Vince Russo debacle, and you have to believe that that also played a part into why Spike dropped TNA and lost trust in the leadership. Because how can they trust... <laughs> how can they trust a company that hired someone back that they hate in secret? How can they trust them? On November 19th, 2014, it was announced that TNA had reached an agreement with Discovery Communications and that TNA Impact would begin airing on Destination America in January and would air on Fridays. The problem is, is that this deal didn't last long and Destination America seemingly had no faith in TNA and let me give you some proof they had absolutely no faith in TNA. First of all, Destination America premiered two TNA spin-off shows along with Impact called Impact Wrestling Unlocked and TNA's Greatest Matches with both of them premiering the same month as Impact in January of 2015. But both these shows were subsequently cancelled in May and were very short-lived at only four months. But hey, still longer than the fake Monday Night War, right? Point number two. They had little faith in TNA to the point where they signed Ring of Honor to a TV deal to air before Impact when Impact was moved to Wednesdays. So literally Ring of Honor airing the same day before Impact. The TNA deal with Destination America ended on December 16th, 2015. And it was announced that TNA would air on Pop TV starting January 5th, 2016. See, the problem with all of these moves to different networks is the fact that TNA actually has a very large casual fan base. 
You look at a company like AEW, it's mainly just a hardcore fan base. But the reason why TNA got a lot of viewers is because they had a casual fan base, mainly thanks in part to having a lot of former WWE talent, wrestling legends, you know, mainly because of that. Like the fact that I knew what TNA was when I was 10 kind of gives you the full picture. And it's because of these different network moves that these casual fans probably weren't aware that TNA had changed networks and probably just saw that Spike wasn't airing it anymore and was confused by it. And as well as that with each move, what's going to happen with these moves is TNA, their, their presentation is going to change to fit this new network and fans probably got bored of these presentation changes and the whole aesthetic of the show being shifted three times in three years. TNA would remain on Pop TV until 2019 when it was picked up by the Pursuit Channel, which did nothing for them. It, Pursuit Channel's a hunting channel, and they were on that channel. They're now on Access TV, which is a big TV deal for them, so that's very good. But we're fast forwarding a bit. Let's go back to 2017, because on July 2nd, 2017, Impact would go through yet another major rebrand. And that will be the subject of the next episode. For the next special feature, my friend Wrestle with Andy, who has his own YouTube channel, which you should check out, link in the description, is going to show you some of the worst TNA merchandise of all time. Thanks Tom, that's right, here I'm going to be talking about some of the very worst TNA merchandise of all time. So first off, let's take a look at this AJ Styles t-shirt. Now I don't want to get this video demonetised for you Tom, so let's just say that this shirt reminds me a lot of the old Val Venus corks locked and ready to unload t-shirt from back in the day. I mean surely somebody in the TNA graphic design department must have noticed this before sending the final artwork to print. I mean it's times like these I'm just glad that AJ Styles has a huge following in okay. the gay community. Next up we have the Errol Hebner damn right I did it t-shirt. Now I covered this one briefly in my top 100 worst wrestling merchandise video a few months back, but let's take a deeper dive into this one. Now we all know Hebner for being an instrumental part of the Montreal Screwjob back in 1997, however what some people may not know is that in 2005 he would be fired by WWE for allegedly stealing digital art files from the company, then printing them onto bootleg t-shirts and selling them on illegally. Who would have then thought that this would ultimately lead to some legitimate wrestling merchandise, with TNA releasing this atrocity, zebra stripes and all. Having said that, I think that this may be the one and only time that a referee has had their own official merchandise to date. Next up we have a unique piece of merch that's not so much bad as it is bizarre. The official TNA Jeff Hardy colouring book. Now by the looks of it, this book has an assortment of illustrations of Jeff's face, where you get to colour in his face paint, and to be honest, I'm surprised that the WWE have never came up with this one on their own. Next up we have the official TNA life-sized vinyl wall stickers. I mean, you could only imagine waking up in the middle of the night with this face staring at you. The thing of nightmares. And to an extent, I could see the value in WWE making these, with the likes of John Cena and The Rock, however I just can't imagine that there's an overabundance of people looking to have a life-sized Bram stuck on their wall. Next up we have the official Eric Young plastic beard. Now it would be one thing to have child-sized versions of this for a little bit of fun at a live event, however these beards are designed seemingly for full-blown adults, to wear at home in who knows what kind of ways. I mean, if the beard was made out of some sort of synthetic hair, that would be one thing. But solid plastic? Just look at that model. Do you ever look at someone and wonder, what is going on inside their head? And here he is! Super Eric, and I'll tell you! Next up, we've got nothing but a good old-fashioned, badly designed t-shirt, being modelled here by the man himself, Sting. I mean surely the company could have came up with something a little bit less generic for one of their most iconic wrestlers in company history. It looks like somebody knocked this one up in Photoshop in less than 5 minutes. And speaking of badly designed t-shirts, this one may be even worse than Sting shirt. This RVD monstrosity has been over designed to say the least, with an all over print featuring what appears to be a dragon intertwined with a yin yang, and the faint outline of some RVD text, this one really is ugly. 
Sorry to interject, but um, I don't think Andy noticed this, but the shirt also says RDV, not RVD on it. And finally, we have the TNA comic book series of t-shirts. And to be honest, I can see where the company were coming from, at least with the Sting version, considering he was playing a Joker-style character at the time. However, this AJ Styles version of the shirt is just plain bad. Another example of where less should be more. I mean, they even managed to fit some paint splashes there in the background. And on top of all of the bad design, AJ clearly isn't too pleased with modelling this one. So that was some of the worst TNA merchandise I could find. Thanks again, Tom, for having me be part of this video. Where we last left off, TNA was switching between TV deals, and when we last left off, they were on Pop TV, having been dropped by Spike before moving to Destination America and leaving after just one year of being in that TV deal. The deal with Pop TV was signed on November 15th, 2015. However, Earlier that year, something major happened because on April 27th, 2015, Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins joined TNA as senior producer of creative and talent development. Billy Corgan is well known to be a wrestling fan and had ventured in the wrestling business before, starting his own promotion called Resistance Pro in Chicago. Corgan's role was for him to develop characters and create storylines and Corgan called the acquisition of this job a dream come true for him. The next year also saw some major wrestlers departing from TNA, Kurt Angle, Samoa Joe, Velvet Sky, Bobby Roode, Eric Young and even longtime commentator Taz. All these guys were longtime TNA servants and are closely associated with the company when you talk about TNA and they all left. But going back to Billy Corgan because just a year and a half later after being appointed as the senior producer of creative and talent development, he was appointed as the president of the company. He replaced Dixie Carter who stepped down to chairwoman and chief strategy officer. And you know what, this was a good move for TNA. I mean, Corgan was actually a wrestling fan. And you know, Dixie Carter, well, she, she wasn't. However, this all went horribly wrong and in turn put TNA in a PR hailstorm. On October 13th, 2016, just two months after being appointed president of the company, Billy Corgan filed a lawsuit against TNA due to an unpaid debt that he claimed TNA had defaulted on. And while this was happening, reports were surfacing that the state of Tennessee had issued a tax line against TNA for unpaid taxes. Forbes quoted in an article that the debt is so bad that the state could have the right to seize TNA property if the debt is not repaid and they also stated that it seems the last days of TNA are definitely upon us. The general consensus going around the whole wrestling community was that this is it for TNA and this is where the plug is finally pulled on them. However, TNA managed to pull through and they just, they just refused to die and on November 3rd, they announced that Anthem Sports and Entertainment were funding TNA in paying back the loans and debt and that Corgan was no longer the president of the company. Anthem would go on to buy a majority stake in the company in January 2017 and Dixie Carter resigned as chairwoman after nearly 14 years with the company. So in the space of six months, a new president has came in, that president being the lead singer of a very popular rock band. He has sued the company, that same company were in trouble with the government of a state. Everyone thought they were going to die, but another large company stepped in, paid all the loans back and the debt, saved them and now owns a majority stake in the company. The president, Billy Corgan, left and the chairwoman who has been there for 14 years also left. So much has happened. Also in that same month of January 2017, Jeff Jarrett was brought back to the company as a consultant. He was brought back while he was having struggles with his own company, Global Force Wrestling, and ooh, ooh, this was the beginning of the end for TNA. Well, actually, it wasn't the beginning of the end for TNA. It was the beginning of the end for Impact, as on March 2nd, all appearances and references of the name TNA were completely dropped. This was probably due to the fact that there was a whole PR nightmare with the TNA name during this Billy Corgan incident. And I guess you could say that this was the day that TNA Wrestling died. 
the name of course, not the company, because at this point the company truly will just never die. TNA was officially branded Impact Wrestling and it was during this time that even more wrestlers left the company. Drew McIntyre, the Hardy Boys, Mike and Maria Kanellis, all among them, all going to WWE. Three of which I actually saw debut live, Drew McIntyre and the Hardy Boys, that was pretty cool. I popped very hard for the Hardy Boys. So it seemed like TNA were finally recovering from everything that happened, they are giving themselves a new name and were starting a new chapter for themselves. But no, because on April 20th, Impact Wrestling announced a merger between them and GFW and once again, Impact was rebranded, this time taking the name of Global Force Wrestling. It's very ironic that this happened on April 20th, 420, because they must have been smoking something when they came up with this decision. This merger was very short lived and as a result, many fans were lost, mainly due to the fact that these rebrands were so confusing and your casual fan isn't going to know what the hell Global Force Wrestling is because Global Force Wrestling never took off and why Impact would want to take that name, a name of a company that isn't popular at all, is beyond me. All Impact and GFW belts were unified with LAX being the unified tag champion and Sienna being the unified women's champion and the worst man becoming the unified world champion and becoming the face of the company. That man being Alberto Del Rio, who would beat Magnus to become the GFW Global Champion and then beat Bobby Lashley to unify both belts, the Global Championship and the TNA World Heavyweight Championship. Him being the face of the company and the top guy was not a good idea. And you know what? To explain why this wasn't a good idea, I'm just going to play an extract from my most recent video. My most recent video was called the Top 5 Worst TNA World Champions of All Time. And on this list, I placed Alberto Del Rio at number one. So here you go. And number one is Alberto Del Rio, or as he was in Impact, Alberto El Patron. El Patron was positioned as the guy to be the top star of TNA when they merged with Global Force Wrestling, aka GFW. Alberto's first reign of the Impact World title took place on March 2nd, 2017, literally his first night in Impact. He won it from Bobby Lashley, however, he relinquished the title literally the next night, so what really was the point? So that was his first reign, one day long. On the May 11th episode of Impact, he defeated Magnus to win the GFW Global Championship and would go on to face Lashley for the TNA World title in a unification match at Slammiversary, which he won, thus unifying the titles and positioning Del Rio as the top star of GFW slash Impact. To this day, we still don't really know what it was called. <laughs> However, on July 12th, Del Rio was suspended by GFW due to a real life domestic incident involving his then girlfriend, WWE Women's wrestler Paige. As a result of the suspension, he was stripped of the title ending his reign at 40 days. And the rest of Del Rio's time in TNA was pretty lackluster anyway, he never really won any titles and he was released from TNA in April 2018 due to no showing the Lucha Underground vs Impact event. I've also realised I've kept on calling it TNA when at this period it's just Impact, so ignore that. Del Rio was not the right guy to be positioned as the top guy in this time for the company. He was unreliable in terms of showing up to shows and very problematic behind the scenes and I think there's a reason why no major company has really signed him since. Like I said, the GFW merger was super short lived. In September of that year, Jeff Jarrett took an indefinite leave of absence due to personal issues and Anthem slowly started renaming the company back to Impact once again and on October 23rd, the termination of their partnership with GFW was officially announced and that ended that chapter. So to end off this video, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be counting down a top 10 list because I am top 10 wrestling. I haven't done a top 10 in like probably a year or two, uh, but I'm gonna do a top 10 list of a question I've been asked many times and that is who is my favorite TNA wrestler of all time? Now we're gonna reveal it. 
First of all, my honourable mentions are EC3, Sting, Kurt Angle, Desmond Wolf, D'Angelo De Niro, Monty Brown, Lethal Consequences, Taylor Wilde, Awesome Kong, Amazing Red, Dr. Stevie, Daphne, Jeff Jarrett, and of course, Scott Steiner. Number 10 is Shark Boy. Shark Boy is just such a goofy gimmick, and my first introduction to TNA in like full was playing the TNA game, and he was just one of my favorite characters to play as. So for that reason, Shark Boy has always resonated with me, and as well as that, he's just a great character. Like when he was mimicking Stone Cold Steve Austin, that was just awesome. Number nine is Suicide. Like I said, my first proper full introduction to TNA was the TNA game, and Suicide was obviously the main protagonist in the story mode, and eventually they made him into a real life character in TNA, and while he wasn't like too popular among like other fans, he just, I just always really enjoyed him, and I always really liked him because of the video game, and he just had such a sick look in my opinion, he looks so cool. Number eight is Broken Matt Hardy. In 2016 and 2017, Broken Matt Hardy helps to bring more eyes back to TNA because his broken gimmick was just phenomenal. I don't know how WWE completely misused him when he returned, but he's just so good when he's broken and I'm excited to see what AEW does with him. Number 7 is Rhino. Now, I never used to like Rhino all that much. I liked him when he was teamed with Heath Slater, but until becoming a fan of TNA, I didn't really like Rhino, but after watching him in TNA, I just think he's awesome. TNA used him so well, he was a big star there, and it's a shame he was never the TNA World Champion. I know he was the NWA World Champion, but he wasn't the TNA World Champion, and I can't help but thinking that he should have been. Number 6 are the Motor City Machine Guns. They are the only tag team to make this list. Alex Shelley and Chris Sabin, I love their style of offense, I love their high flying stuff. I love that. I love them in the X Division as single stars, and I love them as a tag team. Uh, I've always loved the Motor City Machine Guns. I think they're just brilliant, really. Number five is Samoa Joe, arguably one of TNA's biggest stars of all time. How on earth has he not been the world champion in WWE? I say it all the time if you follow me on Twitter, which you should, at Topson Wrestling, that Samoa Joe should have been world champion in WWE by now. One of the best on the mic and in the ring. He is just a full package. He's great. Number four is the Monster Abyss. Another one similar to Samoa Joe and the Motor City Machine Guns, who were kind of one of TNA's homegrown stars. Abyss didn't work anywhere very major prior to coming to TNA, but TNA made him a star. I mean, he was pretty much just a mix of Kane and Mankind. He competed in hardcore matches, and the fans just loved it. I mean, the Monsters Ball matches were great, and in general, Abyss... Just, I just always really enjoyed Abyss, and he's number four on my list. Coming in at number three, we have AJ Styles. AJ Styles, in my opinion, is the greatest TNA wrestler of all time. He's not my favorite of all time in TNA, but in TNA, man, he was amazing. I mean, he was always the guy that TNA could rely on, put on great matches with the likes of Kurt Angle, Abyss, and he was just so good in TNA, man. And... While he is doing well in WWE, like, he was just so much better in TNA, and his theme song in TNA was so much better. I love his theme song in TNA. Also, Abyss's theme song is amazing. I should mention that. Number two, Christian Cage. How on earth did WWE screw up Christian? Oh my god, TNA made this man a star. They made him a two-time world champion. Well, WWE, they made him a two-time world champion, but his world title reigns both lasted about five days and the second one was about a month. Whereas TNA treated him like a star. He was one of TNA's top guys and even when Christian returned to WWE, they weren't treating him right and TNA really used him so well and man, I, I don't know how WWE messed him up. I don't know how. And number one is Tara. Now, many people's favorite wrestlers isn't necessarily the most popular wrestler or someone who's like the best wrestler, but Tara, I just really enjoy. I don't know what it is about Tara. I mean, when she was in WWE as Victoria, I liked her, but she wasn't one of my favorites. But in TNA, she was just portrayed as a total badass, and I really enjoyed that. My favorite match from her is probably the match she had with Awesome Kong inside Six Sides of Steel at Turning Point 2009. As well as that, I really enjoyed her match with Daphne at, I believe, Destination X 2010. 
Tara was a five-time Knockouts Champion and a one-time TNA Knockouts Tag Team Champion. So she's very, very decorated in TNA. And overall, I think she's my favorite wrestler in TNA history. I was thinking about it. I didn't realize she was, but when I was compiling this list, I realized that she was. And I just can't really die, can I? But anyway, guys, that's going to do it for this video. If you did enjoy, then smack that like button. Thank you all for watching this video, guys. This three-part slash four-part series I did for this um, channel back in the day really changed this channel for the better. I love making TNA content. I'm going to be making TNA content for the foreseeable future. But I do want to bring WWE and stuff back into it because I can't make TNA content forever. This company was only around for 14 years. So I can't be making content from TNA forever, but eventually I will branch out. But for now, I'm going to keep at it. And thank you all for watching. Follow me on Twitter at Tops and Wrestling. My Instagram is at I'm Tom Bell. Check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash Tops and Wrestling. Leave a like, subscribe with notifications on. Goodbye and keep on rolling.